Welcome back. In this lecture, we will uh, go over our first part of technical shortcomings in machine learning. Here are the associated objectives. Okay, so in this lecture and then in the one following it, we're going to be going over points brought up in the paper Deep Learning a Critical Appraisal by Gary Marcus. Um, we're going to review uh, some of the key points that he brought up that closely align with lesson objectives. And we're also going to talk about how many of these points are not really deep learning specific, actually, and they actually apply to a wide variety of machine learning techniques, which is why we titled this lecture as being about machine learning in general, not, not deep learning specifically. So here is a list of some of the points. Um, he actually has 10 points in the original paper, but we collapse uh, two of them, um, or three of them, into one, and we'll talk about that. Uh, in this lecture, we'll cover these first four bullets. So the first thing is deep learning is data hungry. And the key behind deep learning is you have more layers of your neural network, and you have more data to train on you're going to get better results. And this has overall been quite true. Uh, this was not necessarily true of early machine learning approaches. There was kind of a point of diminishing returns when you threw data at something like a decision tree. Um, it started overfitting and started falling apart if it got you know too much data. So deep learning you know, was able to zoom past that. An issue with it, though, is since it's essentially it's a, it's a parametric approach. It's making one big, long uh, equation that's fitting to the historical data. To get improvement by a factor of k, it's going to require about k squared more samples. And with deep learning, it's going to have k to the fourth parameters. And this is expensive, not just in terms of computational costs, but actual in terms of things like energy and, and carbon emissions nowadays. And this all stems from the fact that uh, deep learning models are inherently over-parameterized, which means that the number of parameters exceeds the size of the training set. And I'll give you a quick example. Well, a little bit later, I'll talk about why that's the case. But here we see performance on the uh, ImageNet data set. And uh, this recent paper from IEEE Spectrum is extrapolating out what it will take to get the percent error um, down to 5%. And so to get there, the amount of computation to learn such a model uh, is estimated to be equivalent to the amount of CO2 generated by New York City in an entire month. Now, whether or not you care about climate change like, that's a huge amount of electricity just to generate a model to better recognize images. And that's, oh, by the way, only doing a couple percentage points better than what we have right now. That is, that doesn't take all this time uh, to train. And so while it's likely possible that we can do this with the existing techniques in deep learning, um, the cost of doing it starts to, uh, you know, increase significantly. And this is not to mention, another thing that's not included in here, is to get all that extra data to support this, that has to come from somewhere. So people have to label that data. So there's a whole bunch more data that has to be generated and labeled and used to train the model. And that's outside of this you know, very expensive energy costs. Now, to give you an idea of kind of the relationships between parameters and samples, here's another famous uh, machine learning model by Google, um, AlphaFold and AlphaFold2. In the initial AlphaFold, it was trained on 29,000 proteins but used 21 million parameters. So, I mean, that is a lot of parameters. And if you, if this was not a deep learning model, and this was a linear regression model, and you show this to anyone, they would think it's just insane. But with deep learning, you know, this can work. And, you know, why, why is that? Why is this not problematic? 
Well, a lot of it has to do with stochastic gradient uh, descent being highly effective at finding really good model fit and all the improvements that have gone into that algorithm uh, over the past couple decades. So the next thing is, you know, well, so along the lines of deep learning being data hungry, is this contrasts actually with human beings and we're actually quite data efficient. Like in order to learn something new, we don't need millions and millions of samples to get good results. Uh, look at any toddler. You know, they learn things very quickly, often with just one training sample. So, you know, I mean, think of a child touching a hot stove. How many times does that kid need to touch the hot stove to realize that that's not a good idea? It takes them one time. So, in addition to that, that the you know, human performance, you know, can be quite good even without large amounts of data. Um, there are often use cases where you just don't have big data. So think about predicting a pandemic. How many global pandemics do we have in our training set where we have, you know, data for to do analysis on? Well, they don't happen very often. Um, Think about predicting a major terrorist event or something within a war. You know, all of these, you're going to have, these are extreme examples, I'll grant you that, but you can still think of other things that they, there is a small amount of data, but the problems are still important to predict. You're just not going to have, you know, the thousand, the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of training samples available. So then the next thing is uh, limited capacity for transfer. So transfer refers to the ability to take a machine learning model that's trained in one domain and then use it successfully in another. Now, with some of the deep learning approaches, and uh, one that got uh, cited in uh, the Marcus paper was the Atari playing neural network created by DeepMind, small perturbations can potentially cause wildly inaccurate results, and they were talking about perturbations that would lead to accuracy being cut in half. So, and, and this has been showed in across uh, several different domains. And the key intuition though is these counterexamples were not radically out of the distribution of data. And, you know, we'll, in a later lecture, we'll talk about adversarial machine learning and how people have created, like, stickers that go on stop signs that cause deep learning models to not recognize the stop sign anymore. Uh, these are all, uh, you know, directly related to a limited capacity for transfer by deep models. And the reason why this happens is Deep learning models can often identify these kind of superficial patterns that end up perf improving performance, but they're really meaningless in terms of actually classifying something. And it's these superficial patterns that when those are disrupted, then performance starts to drop. Now, despite all that, and, and along with Marcus's writing, we should point out that in terms of taking a pre-trained deep learning model, especially for something like image classification or dealing with textual applications, and using part or all of that pre-trained model as a set of initial layers in a new model that's going to be trained on additional data, that has actually been shown to be an effective way to do business. However, Gary Marcus is not talking about it. He's not talking about taking an existing model, adding more stuff, and then training it again, he's talking about, hey, this existing model starts failing when things are just a little bit different. Now, this inability to transfer, this is not unique to deep learning at all. Um, it has become more pronounced with deep learning, partially due to popularity, partially due to the fact that um, the models are so big, so they have a better chance at finding these uh, kind of superficial uh, relationships. 
Uh, but bear in mind, this inability to transfer, it comes up uh, in pretty much every type of uh, machine learning, standard machine learning model out there. And this also re relates to two other points Gary Marcus brings up that we're not going to talk about in depth, um, inability to model hierarchies and an untrustworthiness of results. And we also have uh, some other content um, relating to, uh, you know, the trustworthiness issue. So the next thing we'll talk about is open-ended inference. So deep learning models uh, to date have not been shown to do very well at open-ended inference. And so think about, you know, you read a text or you read a novel and, you know, a good author of a novel can, uh, you know, drop you hints about a character that, you know, reveals something about him, about his feelings, about his or her motivations and so on. And reading that, you know, we can infer that by the things that the author laid out for us. Deep learning, you know, can't really do that. It can't gather up these hints and then answer an open-ended question. And so, you know, how would deep learning approach the problem? Well, you could have loads and loads of labeled training data for every type of uh, aspect about this, you know, training data that has these kind of hidden inferences in it. But it gets to a point where it's just not realistic to have training data with every you know, kind of little different aspect about the, you know, image or text being labeled in a very precise way. But again, like some of the other things, open-ended inference, this is an area of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning that is really not adequately addressed by anything yet. Uh, but just bear in mind, um, you know, I mean, I think kind of the one of the biggest ones with open-ended inferences where there's, you know, a lot of problems are these uh, chat bots and, and things like that. Um, you know, they're very good at, you know, pattern matching kind of common questions and things like that. But then once you get outside of that or, you know, anything more sophisticated, uh, they start falling apart pretty quick. So explainability. So explainability deals with you know, as seen in this picture, having a black box. So you send input, you get output, you have no clue what goes on inside. And deep learning systems are just notorious for this. Um, there's all these layers, there's all these parameters. It's, uh, you know, they really preclude being able to understand what's going on inside and how it's coming to a given conclusion. So this also directly relates to other issues as well. So it relates to trust. It relates to bias in the system. It also relates to transfer. Because if you don't have an explanation for how it came up with a result, how do you know that it's not showing a given result just because it's biased and that the people who train that model only use data that were relevant for you know a certain a uh, race of people or something like this. Uh, if you want to be able to transfer, how do you know that it's coming up with a result that, you know, when it can't even tell you what were the things about the current environment that led me to come up with this result? And then as a human, you would know, hey, the current, envi uh, the current environment is the same or different from what it was trained on. Well, you don't know that because it doesn't tell you uh, what was used in coming with the, up with the output. Now, there are other uh, machine learning methods that are explainable, and some we covered in this course, such as rule mining and some of the decision tree variants. Now, I'm not saying that they're better than deep learning. They have their own slew of problems, um, especially with scalability and performance and brittleness and so on. But um, if explainability and trust in the system is important, um, you need to do some really, uh, you know, hard thinking as you take your machine learning approach. So that's it for part one. Stay tuned for part two.